those moments of like sitting and laughing are actually my favorite pieces of law enforcement. Like I don't look back and say like, oh, it was great going to this or great making that arrest. Like I don't even remember half that crap. Um, what I remember is the people I worked with, the mm -hmm. funny things that happened between us. Um, the bond you built. Yeah. Ashley, you're killing me. No, you are killing me. True, true, I am. But this week I did have a awesome guest, Brian Shea, who writes all about killing in his fiction book, The Camel's Back. So. Big shout out to Brian, glad he came in. I'm Very looking forward guest. to hearing about him and hearing about what he does in his spare time to de-stress. Yes, it's very interesting. Is it? Very. Oh goodness, I can't wait. Hey, I'm here with Brian Shea. He's an author, police officer for 11 years and also an ex-military officer. Brian, welcome to the show. Thank you. So as a law enforcement officer, you know, a cop, on a street, you know, we talked before setting up here, you've seen a lot of death. Yep. Now, that must really weigh on your heart when you get home at night. <clears throat> I'm, I'm pretty good at compartmentalizing, so I, I came up with some things, uh, or they just kind of happen naturally. I used some of my own uh, like side talents to kind of counteract some of the stuff I saw, so I didn't inject it on my family. So Now, is that why you started writing? <clears throat> that is why I started writing. This kind of came when I was working with sex crimes. I needed a huge break from from that, that mental yeah. plaque that kind of forms, and, and that, that became my, my outlet. Um, and then before that, I used, to, I used to draw and cartoon. It's actually how I paid my rent in Texas, was uh, working for a local paper doing editorial cartoons. So uh, that was also a, a good escape, because I could basically make fun of maybe sometimes somebody in a department, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and do it in a, you know, sort of, quasi-political setting and then kind of it was a good release and mental escape and drawing cartoons of your supervisors is always fun so exactly I mean you need some way to get out of that stress zone and just inventing comedy and writing is like just you know a lot of times we talk about you know reaching out to your friends even if it's a text and I do it all the time with my friends I'm like hey you know what blah 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 it's like some funny busting someone whatever and if you're not busting someone's chops I always say you don't really like them Right, you know, right, it's right. one of those things. Like, if someone's not making fun of you, then there's something wrong with you. <laughs> right, right. It's the same thing if they don't drink with you. Then I have, uh, I have nervousness about them, too. I can't, <laughs> I can't trust them very far, either. Um, yeah, no, 100%. And, and not everybody in law enforcement can reach out to every, everybody else, right? No. There's People create their safety networks, the people that they can trust. Like, uh, you, can, you can bust chops, you can joke. And then in those moments where you just need to really, like, let it out for real... They'll do it, and they will never um, betray that. I, you know, to the benefit now, I speak my mind. I don't hold back uh, when something's on my mind, probably, probably to a fault at times, right? But, like, uh, it is super important to that cathartic release. And if you could realize that earlier in your career, oh, you yeah. know, and that's the thing is, like, you know, after, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, you're kind of like, that makes a lot of sense. But if I could go back, but now it's like, just start talking to those young guys. Start talking to the people mid-career. Just start talking. Yeah. And listen, and that's the other thing. So you, I think the wisdom's there. I mean, every department, big or small, has that those wise, seasoned veterans willing to share. It's when, And it's hard, it's hard to bridge. When you're that young 20-something with an armband tattoo and going to <laughs> stripper hairdresser Mondays at the pavilion with your six-pack of abs, mm -hmm. it's hard to listen to, um, you know, somebody that may be a little softer and looks, you know, he's yeah. older and doesn't seem to move with as the same step. You kind of, like, mm -hmm. separate yourself yeah. from him. So it's hard to take in that feedback. You're like, oh, well, he's a burnout or he doesn't know yeah. what he's doing or look right. at him. I can do more push-ups, right? And I always... If they're open-minded, you listen to them and you see past like the, some of the differences, there's a wealth of, of people out there that are willing to share. Um, but sadly, I feel like no matter how, times it's, how many times it's said, like, it, people have to get smacked in the face with it. They have to learn their own lesson. It's like, it's Help like, is not a dirty word. Right. It, you know, we have such a stigma with anybody asking for help in the LEO community. Because like you said, six-pack abs, I'm ready to go. And a lot of times you don't figure out you need help until, you know, until it's too late. Yeah, 
I mean, and there's, I mean, obviously there's a big call to action about the number of suicides and law enforcement related suicides. And there's, uh, you know, it, it, and people are trying to get the word out through the the, the twenty two the push up competition, all these mm-hmm. things, trying to drive the awareness. But awareness is is a small piece of it because everyone can say they know that uh, autism's out there, but till you're a parent and you yeah. deal with that, and you don't know those challenges, and you don't know that you can reach over to your neighbor or two doors down, and they may be a, have gone through a similar circumstance, and can guide you and just let you know sometimes that. It's okay. There's a ton of resources out there. 22, yep. 800 numbers. But a lot of times it comes down to like, you know, if I saw you over there and we started chatting, that release, that five minutes of just talking to someone with a like mind, yep. you, it's just like a weight off of your shoulder. And then, you know, you keep in touch. Be like, hey, you know what? Shoot me a text. You know, you ever feel anything bad, I'm up, I'm text me, whatever, we'll talk. And that's kind of like the peer support network, but in like grassroots, you know? So yeah, it's it's uh, in and I think that the hard fast model of peer support is is and this is my personal opinion is too formalized mm-hmm. in the sense that it feels like you're going to a counselor even though it's yep. another cop and you feel like they don't really give a crap about you and maybe they they did it because they're like super caring people and they thought ah oh, you know I want to help other cops um, but it's not. In my personal opinion, it's not always they're not always as effective as as somebody you trust over mm-hmm. them. If you tell me that three people are on a, on a peer support program, but they're not three people I trust, yep. I'm never going to go to them. Never, never. I I don't care what training they've been through, and mm-hmm. they can listen to me and counsel me. Um, if they're not in my personal circle of trust, then they're never going to hear the real story. And build a circle of trust. Yes. Don't be a loner. Yeah. Don't, you know, a lot of times people are like, hey, you want to go grab a beer after work? Well, maybe I don't drink. Well, hey, you want to get a cup of coffee? Yeah. I don't drink coffee. Then you want to just go drink water on the side of the road. I don't care. Let's just go BS. Yeah. And you need, yes. So I will say the cool thing, and it, it happened a lot um, out West. And I think it was, we had longer shifts. We were 12 hour shifts. So there was, you know, moments, obviously on a night shift, uh, you know, those, that, that six to two or three hour, you know, six PM to like two or three in the morning is your high time. You know, you're getting whatever is coming through, mm-hmm. uh, the call wise. But I remember we would, me and my, my partners, we would go out and we would sit at this like shell station. It was the only thing open like 24 mm-hmm. hours, or whatever, sit on the hood after a call. And we'd always, you know, bust each other's stones, make fun of each other. Uh, back then you could smoke, so we'd sit and have a cigarette. You know, that was so healthy. Like you would laugh, you would yeah. tell a joke, it was a break. We'd run into county guys, uh, sheriff guys, we'd all meet there, tell stories. Those moments of like sitting and laughing are actually my favorite pieces of law enforcement. Like I don't look back and say like, oh, it was great going to this or great making that arrest. Like I don't even remember half that crap. Um, what I remember is the people I worked with, the mm-hmm. funny things that happened between us. Um, the bond you built. Yeah. Well, that's one thing we need to talk about. And that's one thing we did talk about was just building a circle of trust and just having someone there. Brian, I really appreciate you coming in, man. Absolutely, bro. He's got books out all over. How many books do you have now? Uh, Five out now with a new series starting in uh, August or September called uh, Murder Board. Awesome, man. Thanks a lot for coming in, bro. All right, bro. Thank you. That was a great interview. Brian is an interesting character. He is accomplished author. And what does he do in his spare time? He likes to draw. What pictures? We're not sure We're yet. We're not sure. We, I feel we, like he says that he likes to draw certain things, but he draws some other different things. Yeah, if you've been in the police or military, you kind of know what he draws, but we dark, don't know. A little dark. Dark personality. He also likes to go swimming. He does. Hangs out with his wife and his kids, so that's good. Productive things. Thank you. Thank you.